going through my mind, most of the spiritual uh, dealing with uh, what the Lord wants done, what's getting done, how He wants it done. You know, I'm a, always a type of person that tries to figure out what the Lord wants, what I can do to contribute to, to the service. So they can go over, be a success, and I'm sure that's what all of us are hoping to be, want to be. And uh, I, I know that we're just as pitiful as I am. I know that the Lord will come by and anoint me. There's a lot of them want me to sing at times. And I look at them, I say, Well, you preach. You know, it takes the same anointing to preach, sing, testify, whatever you do. It takes that unction from God to come down and to give you a, a, a reason or a feeling or a direction to do what you want to do. But uh, I was uh, just like you were today, on a very rainy day. Those that have workplaces to go to, I was in that at one time. I, I don't know how that is, but once you leave that workplace and become full time ministry, and then these rainy days, you have no excuse not to pray and read. Uh, it's not like uh, working in the garden or out trimming bushes or doing something. It wasn't much you could do outside of the day. So I'm like most full time ministers. I spend my time praying, and reading, and trying to just get my mind wrapped around something. And I have found out that's good, but that's bad. You know, I, you can wrestle and read so much that you you get so much in your mind, and it gets in such a turmoil in there that the Lord don't come by and help you unravel it. You've got to well off. At times, I've been on the other side of that. We come home just enough time to clean up and run the church, and felt like I wasn't worthy for nothing. It seemed like that the Lord would come by and do maybe better than that. So hopefully, I haven't over prepared for this, but. Uh, I'm trying to keep the mind of God, you know, and the Lord, He's not confused. He's not uh, going north a while and turn around going south and then running the obstacle and turn go east. You know, He's not like that little inner uh, jazz or bunny just to go on and bounce to and fro. He started a plan a long time ago with ministers and people, and it's no accident that we are here tonight, you know, this group of people. The Lord orchestrated this by His mighty power and His direction. He put forth in your mind to be here tonight uh, to do what He would have you to do. You know, testify, saying, mm -hmm. of course that. But on the other side of that, He prepared me as His mouthpiece to say something, to encourage you, to, to, to help you see Christ in a more clear fashion you know. And one thing we want to, to realize, you know, I often say this, when I got Jesus, I got Jesus. Uh, I didn't get a part of him or a piece of him or, or just a, a little bit, you know, bits and pieces in that form. But I got him in a form uh, 30 some years ago and he's not in the same form today. And, and we see that in the natural. Most of us, when we were born little babies, you've seen me when I was a little eight pound, red faced thing about that big. My mommy holding me and then looked at me today and would never know it was the same person. Although it is the same person. And whenever we get uh, born again in Christ and, and He becomes our life, we're made in Christ. And uh, we spend a lifetime in the church, you know, and reading and praying and just put so much effort into trying to become something that God wants to use. You know, you think about uh, just the, the privilege tonight uh, to just be a, a praying person, living separated from sin and, and, and trying your best ability uh, to do something that God wants you to do, and to be for Him to bid you and find you worthy to do that. You know that that's look look at what we are part of. You know uh, Moses was found worthy to do that. Peter, John, Paul, the early uh, apostles of, of the Bible was found worthy to do these type of things. And although I'm nothing in the sight of God as to compare myself to them, but still I'm a part of the ministry of Christ, and it's it's a uh, very important. As we come in to the closing of time, you know, I think of this, uh, and I, I don't know when the coming of the Lord is, but I can tell you right now, I'll never live another 50 years. I, I, I about guarantee you that. Uh, so I know that the coming of the Lord is just a few years away from me. And, and I want to, to, my last days, if they would be, want to be my best days. And I, I would like to, and I had a thought on this, as every morning I rise to my to meet God, of course I always start my day in prayer, you know, before I get out and get uh, stirred up in a lot of doings. 
And in, in putting a state of, of mind, I would love to be able to just keep myself as much as I can, the Lord keeping me, the, the, the torments of the mind that comes and temptation, you know, all that buffets us to try to make us feel like we're not what we need to be. I'd like to stay so focused that I would know that it's by the grace of God, regardless of what attacked my mind today, or had what tried to just oppose itself against God, I can stand here before God, being as pure as anybody that's ever stood, because it's by His mercy and by His grace that I get to speak, that I get to do anything. And I, I was thinking of a revival, and I back up again and say, 30 years that we win, it's unreal. Of the messages that I have heard preached over those years. I've heard a little of everything. Some of it I, I know was true. Some of it I know wasn't true. Some of it still today, maybe I don't fully understand it. But I've heard enough to bring me to the place that I know that if anybody, anything goes wrong in my life, I can't look at you and blame you. I can't say that you caused me uh, to not be what God wanted me to be. You know, that in the early forms of life, you now that can happen. You know, we're warned that it would be better for us. We had a millstone cast around our neck and us cast into the depths of the sea than to fail one of God's little ones. Now, little babes in Christ, we need to be very careful about what we tell them, how we tell them, instruct them, you know. And it's very important that we do that. But as we grow as Christians, you know, we must try to remember what we've been taught. You know, the Lord, I say this, He's not taking blind stabs in the dark. He's not up here casting something to this side, that side, and just saying a verse here and one over there and rambling on and trying to find something that he can excite the crowd with. He has a reason. Christ has a purpose to, to death tonight. And, and what I'm going to read through here, I want you to know that the, the start that you've made, the one I've made, is, is real, folks. It won't get any more real in your life. The realest the, the, the way that I can ever know that I know God was the first time I ever knew him. But he's still brand new. You know, every time, every time he blesses me, every time he gives me a revelation or an interpretation of something and, and speaks to me, it's brand new every time he speaks. But, but we must realize that Christ has begun a work in us. He wants to perform it until the end. And to, to, to be what Christ wants you to be fully, you have to understand that you, you probably never in this life achieve everything that God wants you to be. Now we can have a goal, have a have a desire to be that. I want to be that, you know. And I read of a lot of miracles that these people's done with this Bible, and I know that there's a place that, that is above where I'm living because I can just see it just, just right ahead of me. And I know that by my desire to make it there, one of these days I'll no doubt make it in the presence and the realm of, a, of an existing God that still is above me. Now, now, what I want what to show you here is something. Uh, I, I touched on this way back. John, you know, they call him John the Revelator. He was on Isle of Patmos. Well, you know, he was walking one night with the Lord. He's probably at death me. Whenever he ascended up, there was about 500 brethren, you know, he's seen him there, walked on the shores of Galilee with him, and preached around him, and, and was right sent out and done the miracles that Jesus gave him to do. Then he got out here on the island called Patmos, you know, and the Lord appeared to him, and he bowed down and trembled, and didn't know who he was. And, and he took him, you know, and just kind of petted on him, and said, you know, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, you know. I, and he introduced himself, and he know he was Christ. So Christ, don't be afraid. You know, he'll present himself to you in, in ways at times that is above your ability to understand. But yet you know it's a spiritual form and the existence of God. It's just because you don't understand it don't mean it's, it's not God. And then when and I started this little race certain years ago, uh, I, I was just like you others. I accepted what God wanted me to be. I had no idea that it would ever end up like this. But I, I want to just tell us, you know, tonight, uh, let's not believe in vain. Now, if we would think, well, I've not. Well, there's been a lot of people who have heard a lot of good messages down through life that you can probably write a book on and put their names on a list that used to sit beside you in a church house that listen to the same services and messages that you've heard and skipped you. You'll hear tonight going on, pressing on with God, and you can look, you can think of other people that listen to the messages you've heard that's not sitting here tonight. Maybe they turn aside, back to doing sinful things, whatever, however they've done, 
But we know that that in, in the course of that, it wasn't the will of God that they would hear what you've heard that's kept you. But they what they got, they heard in vain. Something entangled. Something that was more interesting to them than Christ. Now I'll tell you, you know, if, if in this life you'll be faced with things that seemingly entices you, that look so good, that you'll just think, well, a little of this won't hurt, a little of that. But I tell you, you know, stay away from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Stay with God. Pray with Him. Seek Him above everything in your life. Know that you are an example to the people that live around you, and you are to bear much fruit. Well, that's what He wants us to do, produce Christians. You know, a lot of times, the biggest part of what we've heard of bearing fruit is, is to try to pull somebody where, you know, you know, and which I, I'm not against saying that. But fruit is what you produce. See, it, it is the people around you that you are influencing that causes them to want to be a, a Christian, want what you've got. And I, I've said this, you know, there's a lot of folks that I've heard testify that I don't know how anybody can want what they've got. If they wasn't murmuring and complaining, they stole all from somebody. You know, just making fun uh, of anything, scorning. And just sounded so ill, so out of place, you know, and that, that is not very true, you know. They might have looked apart and all like that, but we said we was warned to be, to be uh, wise and be careful of, of these wolves that come to us in sheep's clothing. So we know there's going to be deceivers out there that's going to look apart. And he said, Emily, the raven wolves, you'll know about the fruits. Are they producing life? Or are they producing what I call a cult and a bunch of zombies just doing what they're doing? But listen to this. I want you to think about something, and and and, and not. To, I don't want to discourage. You. I think about what a wonderful move of God that I've watched upon people and the deliverance that they have obtained. And yet, knowing that that there's so much to learn, if we're going to get it. We must get it right, and we don't have long to get it right because we can look at this world. And I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not talking about the news. I mean, you may watch it. I, I just don't. I just choose not to fool much with all that. And, and I'm not saying if there's anything wrong. Maybe I might go home and hear something, turn it on, and, and just uh, uh, be involved in it. But I, I'm just deciding that for my purpose and my calling is to minister this Word of God. And if we don't know that this world is out of order, upside down, and, and that America, folks, is blunted on, it, on its face, ungodliness, and all we know of what's around us, we can see all of that. And we've been told that there's a trouble coming and people's going to mourn. They're going to cry. They're going to wonder what to do. They're going to be looking uh, for a God. And if we don't know that there's something dreadful coming to our little country to try us like we've never been tried, then you, you've listened in vain. You've not paid any attention because we know that that's going to happen. Now, in the first, first Corinthians, in the 15th chapter, I've got four or five verses here I'm going to read. I, I'll be around a place or two, so maybe... Uh, forgive me if I don't give you time to turn and find it. Uh, I'm just uh, just that way. You know, if you've ever preached, sometimes your mind don't go where the note is, and sometimes you think of Scripture and you don't even read the ones you thought you was going to read. You know, you just get up here and you have the curses of God and just let it come out and sound right, Brother Herschel. That's where that goes sometimes. You know, there's nothing wrong. But one of the greatest powers that I've ever seen a man have his ability to put his thoughts on paper. And a lot of times people say, well, I might not want to do that. But I'm glad there's some people put their thoughts on some paper, you know. Yeah. Right here it is. Yeah. And, and that, that takes a great skill to be able to do that. And I admire people that can. But I, I'm just a, a little bit behind that. Maybe, you know, not, but I, I try to get my thoughts together. But what I want to tell you tonight is don't believe in vain. And, you, if, and not that anyone is. But let me forewarn you to take heed, be careful what you hear, how you hear, who you pay attention to. Make sure it's coming from the Word of God. And whenever it comes from the Word of God, uh, just make sure that you believe and don't believe in vain. Because uh, Paul dealt with this here in the, in the first verse here of this, uh, I think I said 15 chapters. says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. And by which also we are saved. Now see them what a great, uh, he just commanded them so high. Uh, you know, he's preached them to them. They received it. They're standing and where they're saved. And he throws that word if in there. And, and that, that makes, now then, he, he's telling them, pay attention here. If you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. 
So it means a lot. You know, we've heard a lot of information over the last couple of weeks. You're going to hear a whole lot more information in the years, days to come if the Lord carries because the Lord is going to be dealing with His Word of God, for His people of God. And one of the greatest warnings, heard a wonderful great message last night, those of you who was here, uh, just about getting entangled with maybe wise fables, and, and, and we've used a lot of illustrations about the uh, generations before us. You know, we've got to be current time Christians. Now, there's people going to help you. They're going to tell you things that's going to help you along the way. But somewhere in this, there's going to somebody tell you something that you don't so much need to hear. So we want to make sure that we lay hold on eternal life, that we believe and hold in memory the things that Christ has told us. These preachers have preached their hearts, and they've told us, you know, that one of the greatest works that the Lord is trying to do in this day and time is to pull us out of tradition, pull us out of a mindset of having judgmental hearts, and having things that we feel that is a plot or people needs to acquire that maybe the Bible never did teach, never did bring out, never did it really be what God wanted to be, but in time people associate that with the gospel. They, they lived in that, had a, had a big anointing, and people agreed, and it went over good, and it satisfied the crowd. But now we've come to a place where the Lord now is, is what I use the term rather than a chain to know. He's letting us know what are you saying? What are, why are you really preaching that? Why are you telling people things that my Bible won't support? Why are you illustrating this? So we must keep these things in mind unless we believe in vain. Because they, the Lord is going to pull this cover off, the bed is going to get too narrow, the cover too short. And when you see this line, it's going to be a plumb line. And when you find a way, it's going to be an old way. And he, you inquire about walking there in. A lot of people are going to say, I'm not going to do that. There's people probably that you've been around in church with all your life. that are going to go right on telling things that it's not biblical. It's being what God requires and judgmental hearts against folks. And, and the preacher's telling them that you need to come out from among that type of stuff. Start loving what God loves. So let's hold these things in our heart. If you go down to the 12th verse, now, and he said, now, so I'm not, I'm not skipping this for any harm. You can read through it. But I want to get to a point here. It says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, and we can understand probably when this was written, when it was brought out, there was people you know, was paid to say that uh, Christ was carried off and that the resurrection wasn't real. You know, there were just rumors going about. But I want to tell you, in bringing right in uh, to this March in 2013, and say, if Christ be preached and rose from the dead, how say some of you that there's no resurrection? Now, I can tell you folks, I believe 100%. Beyond anything that anybody can ever say, preach, stand on your head, run. I know that Christ lives in me. I know that there's been a resurrected Christ. And how can some of us say that Christ is risen when we won't live a life of a resurrected Christ? He died that we could have life, have it more abundantly, that we could walk in newness of life. Remember, you get the Lord, and all things is past, old things is passed away, all things become new. And if we, if we preach that Christ has rose from the dead, and, and we say that He's a risen Savior, we're supposed to be like Him. We're supposed to be buried with Him in baptism, risen with Him. We're supposed to walk that way. And, and, and if you'll think about this, and I'm not nobody's judge, folks, but I know right from wrong. I know where the anointing of God wants us to go, and I know when folks maybe don't understand, but I also know whenever some have believed in vain. Whenever the preachers preach to you things, and you continue in that, and just drag your feet along, there's no change in you, no heart to be more like Christ. Uh, that you need to keep in memory what you've heard. And you need to realize that this Christ that has been preached and He rose from the dead, and, that, and some of you, how, how can you say that He's risen when you're not risen? You know, we, we must live this life. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Paul says the resurrection of the dead. This dead man got resurrected. I, I'm just, I love what the pastor says. The worst thing you've ever done in your life, that the, the, wherever you might have been, whatever it was about, however it was, that's who Christ died for. You at your worst state. You know, we don't want to remember that. We want to uh, get in and the Lord cleanses us up and puts us on the way we walk in newness of life for several years. 
Yeah, here comes somebody that's a three-year-old Christian or two-month-old Christian. We want them to be just like we are. We want them to understand what we understand. What I need to do, I need to live a resurrected life. Yeah. And I, I've given some advice today. If you want to help somebody, let them know that you care for their soul. Let them know that you're trying to reach into their person, trying to in your best ability to establish Christ as being the center of all that you are. You know, we can establish a lot of carnal ideas, a lot of beliefs, a lot of things that we agree in. You know, you go different places around the mountain, we different churches. You know, the reason they go to those different churches, they suck about that building, they think it separates that and makes it better than anywhere else. Oh, if they didn't, they would go somewhere else. Don't you attend the church if you feel like it's spiritually fulfilling your life? I, I do that. And, and, but that's not to say that I wouldn't go anywhere and, and, and be part of the service if I'm invited to be there. But what we need to do, if there's no resurrection of Christ, uh, then, then is Christ not risen? He is risen because I have lived, uh, I'm living a resurrected life. Think of what a, uh, if you want to call it sorrowness, I don't know how bad it was. I was just a sinner man like anybody else. But Christ seen me and I was one born out of due time. He knew that one day that I would come to a place where He could use me to say things that other people was afraid to say. And, 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 to, and to work in a manner that a lot of people won't allow themselves to work. So he, he seen that and he resurrected me and let me feel that there's a newness of life in me and I want to share that life with you. Uh, that, you know, I've watched the law late down ago and, and the things harshly spoken put out, you know, and someone thought there's a warning somebody. All they was doing is driving them further from Christ. My idea is to bring you closer to Him. And if I can do it in a way and preach in a way, pray for you in a way and, and behave in all the manners and everything about me be Christ-like, why would we want what I am? Uh, I, I, it don't take you long, you know, to figure people out. You go to church and you see somebody that's really annoying, really kind, really coming across in a good way, and, the, and the, their voices are reaching out. It's changing who you are. It's challenging you. It's touching what you pray about today. They're bringing you closer to Christ. You want that. Somebody gets up and starts beating you over the head over some old memory that you're trying to forget. Lord, that's no help to you whatsoever. When you come to Christ and you repent of your sin, folks that are cast as far away from you as the east is from the west, to never be remembered against you no more, folks. They would do no preacher, nobody, any good whatsoever to bring your past up, to tell you, well, he was this, he was that. We were all separated from the love of God. He was everyone, uh, not what we needed to be. That's why he gave his life. That's why he, he hung up there, that I could be risen with him. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is vain. But I guarantee you it's not vain. But if you... Well, don't keep in memory the things that you've heard. And if you don't do that, uh, you're going to let something slip. And then you're going to not be able to resurrect that Christ can't live through you. He, he's wanting to use you as a vessel to express Himself through. That's what He wants. That's the only reason the church is here, is to be an extension of Jesus Christ. And He went to Bethany, and then two men standing there in a white pearl said, Why stand you here gazing? This same Jesus you see going up in like manner is going to return. And they went off to Jerusalem, you know, to form a church. And we know how, how all that went. But i tell you what they've done. You know, people want to lean on Pentecost. They want to lean on holiness. They want to lean on some type of, of word saying, this is what I'm part of. But all they want is to speak in tongues. But folks, what about the 3,000? They got saved on the first message that he preached. Honey, where is that proof? Where, where, where is the men at the gate beautiful? So they took him by the right hand and said that he'd been there uh, 38 years or maybe over 40 years. That man was in that shape. It was the Bethesda, maybe 38 years. He was over 40 years old that that miracle had been performed on. Folks, that is the, the anointing we need. You know what? It's easy to talk something. But if, if this Christ is risen in us, it will produce a resurrected life. Yeah. And we, what, what you've got to be in, in cautious of doing and realizing is yes, you as an innocent person, not understanding the depths of God, and I, there's plenty I don't understand, 
But I will not have to give account of so much of what I don't understand, but I'll have to give account of everything I resist. Mm -hmm. When you tell me something, and, and it is the infallible Word of God coming in, in, into my the mailbox to bring me closer to Christ, and I don't want that, it doesn't matter why I don't want it. You just pick these multiple reasons why you can resist the truth. You will never proceed no further. You can never get no closer to God until you deal with what He's told you to deal with. The Colossians also taught on the same thing. He said, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, or Christ set upon the right hand of God. Set your affections on, thing, on things above, not on things of the earth. Let me stop there a minute. I can just tell you of my life. You know, of course, young people, when I was young, a lot of vanity in my life, a lot of interest, and I've done a lot of different things, put a lot of time in different things that today don't amount to nothing. But I've come to a place in my life where I just seemingly don't have a will or an affection or a desire to do no earthly thing. I want a big old farm, and if you can come out there and look at it, and, and, and it, what it do, I've done come to the realization of the knowledge to know if Christ tarries and He does not return, it'll put me in the grave, it'll put the next man in the grave, the bushes that keep growing, the fences that keep falling down, and it'll put the next man in the grave. Folks, vanity is vanity. All is vanity. So all, all what we need to do is get our affections on something that's going to matter. Uh, and look where I'm at in my life. Done in the sunset. Headed down the backside. There won't be too many days. And the Lord will be taking me home. And if I don't get caught up in meeting in the clouds, however it is, folks, this is all about meeting in peace. It's all about being ready. If my affections is on anything other than on Him, then I'm going to miss something that He's got for me. He can't talk to somebody that's cross eyed You can't serve two masters, God and man, and you're going to claim the one. They're going to despise the other. You know how that is. Youngsters, get your affections on things above. Honey, start looking up. Start realizing your redemption may be a whole lot closer than what you want to realize that it is. And be careful that you don't believe in vain. These messages don't go out sanctified living, the testimonies, of, about uh, being decent in order and all like that. I tell you, I went to, to Myrtle Beach one time uh, several years ago to come out some of my children down there. And I'll just say this, I was probably the only man on the beach with a full set of clothes on. The folks will be the same way. Don't believe in vain. Don't think that I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, 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 and that's not too hard. That's just sanctified living. That's just what Christ wants you. And, and, and whenever you set your affections on things above, you'll realize the same thing. You'll, you'll know that Christ wants to be formed in you. If He's risen and, 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 and in you, then, then why can we say He's risen? Some people say that He is. Some say He's not. In, in, but in the years that He did rise, but I can say that He is risen. Because I live a risen life. What drives me? What causes me to want to pray? And, and I, I don't know how many, I know it doesn't matter. I want to pray today long or in red. And, but there's something drives me. There's an affection in me that I know is going to produce something beyond my ability to comprehend. If I just go on and not believe in vain. He, he's told us many great things. Give us many great promises and let us understand that there's trouble coming. We can escape that. I feel like this. I'm not above something coming and grieving me to where I think I can't live the next moment. Things can happen and I know that. But that there said there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Folks, nothing can separate me from that. Now you can treat me like you want to. Say what you will. Folks, you can't keep me from loving you. Because the minute I don't love you, then I don't love God. Because if I can't love you that I've seen, I can't love Him that I don't see. So we must keep this thing right. If you want God, you can have God. But you cannot resist it. You cannot keep it told down this way and say, I just want this part of it. I just want to let that part of it go. This sounds good to me. If they want that, they can have that. One of the worst things that ever got taught and around that I've ever heard, it may be sin to you and not to me. I've never read that in my life. What I did read was that all unrighteousness is sin. I did read that. So how in the world can we pick and choose? Somebody wants to do something. And something else I can tell you, some folks don't, but this hurts you whatsoever. But we need to come to a place 
that when we are doing something, we're looking over our shoulder, and we think somebody's seeing us, watching us, and we feel uncomfortable around the saints of God. How do you don't take an angel or somebody to come down, bump you on top of the head, tell you to lay that down? Quit that. I had to quit a lot of things. I chewed enough mammoth came to buy me probably one of these pickup trucks wood to haul it. Didn't take me long to understand, folks, there's no spit tunes in heaven. Didn't take me long to understand that. So I got rid of that stuff. And, and, and we, you know, people think that's too hard. No, that's exactly what we need. We need yeah. to know that God expects things out of us. He wants us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of this flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's what He wants. And, and if you, if you're gonna set your affections on things above, You'll start understanding this. You know, it won't be hard. It will, it'll just be the, the message to just introduce to you a conviction you're already feeling. It'll just be a witness to let you understand that it's time uh, to not believe in vain, not to hear things and just let it go in one ear and out the other. Uh, but but they, just the life of Christ. I don't know what else to tell you. For, for you are dead and your life is here with Christ in God. Is your life hidden? Now what that means is, folks, you have such so much lacking, and everything that you do is so much in his person that your life is hid in Christ. Now we, we can battle around on that and say, well, my life's hid in him, then go out here and do anything that you want to do. Why? Well, we don't have in that. So, so we must realize when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. And I'll drop down here to this verse 10. And, and, and just read it to you. And, and, it's, and it says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, if Christ was a walk in this earth, and, and just think of, of what manner of person that he was. Well, just stop a bit and think. Here you are sitting under a tree doing what you're doing or whatever. It might have been and Christ comes walking by. He had no other purpose but to deliver people from what they was. And, and the first thing he had to do was forgive them. He had to forgive them, told them, go sin no more. Well, you know, they jumped up from there and they know their life was changed. Some of them, honey, said, take your bed up and walk. The Pharisees didn't like that. But Christ said, well, what's easier to do? Tell, he, he, told, he told them, you know, your sins is forgiven. They, they didn't like it. Didn't like the way he done it. Well, it's just as easy to say, take your bed up and walk, and your sins forgiven. But what's as easier to say? So if Christ has forgiven you of your sins, you have a right to take up and move and do what he wants you to do. And, and But do it with, with every bit of the dignity that you can, every bit of the understanding. I tell people like this, just let me forewarn you, the devil will make a monkey out of him if you let him. Uh, they don't never attempt to work for God when you're not prayed up like you need to be. Commit yourself to prayer. Commit yourself to the service of God. Commit yourself to paying attention. Then when that little quickening spirit gets upon your heart, want you to stand up, hold a hand up, sing a song, pray for somebody, whatever it might be, witness, I can, and the list just goes on. The Lord's the orchestrator of that. And if you'll seek things that's above, folks, He'll use you in His kingdom. He wants to do that. So, so this image of Christ, that's what we're to be. And, 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 and one of the things that the Lord dealt with me in, you know, I, I do a lot of study just like you do, and a lot of things I don't fully understand, and maybe I just understand enough to blurt out a question at you a little bit. But I, I was reading, it's in uh, Revelation 15, 1 and 2, and, and I, maybe I can't quote it all just like it is. Uh, I can find it over here pretty quick. Got it marked here. Now listen to this. This takes place uh, before the seven angels get ready to pull the plagues out. And it's this brother John and part of this that he's seen. And this has to do with the image. Now, those of you that has been around me, you've heard me use the phrase that supporting political systems that uh, oppose the things that's of God, that that's worship in the image of the beast. Maybe you didn't catch that, but here I'm going to show you something. In, in what this is saying. And then John speaking, he said, I saw another sign in heaven, great marvel, seven angels, having the seven last plagues, and in them is filled up the wrath of God. So we know the wrath of God is getting ready to be poured out. And then he turns his attention. And he said, I saw as it were a sea of glass, and you Bible readers know that the sea of glass is before the throne. He says, Made with fire, and then on that sea of glass, here's what he's looking, here's what he's seeing. And them that had gotten victory over the beast, over 
his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. And I've often read that, you know, and God, he don't put nothing in his Bible unless it means something. And, and he broke that up, the victory over the beast, over his image, and, and to have victory over something, the way you don't have victory over the image of the beast, if you're in his image, if you're betraying anything that he wants, uh, doing something that, that, that uh, just a, a shadow of what he is, like voting for people that support abortions, that's worshiping the image of the beast. I know that's very close, and that might get in your politics. I don't know. I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm free from all of that. But I, you need to understand that. That's, that's what that is. And, and in order for us to, to not worship the image of the beast, we can't believe in vain. Remember the first little scripture here I read you? But the boss also, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believe in vain. So we must believe what we hear. If it touches us, plows us, changes our attitude, grieves us, however we've got to deal with it, we've got to deal with it. We've got to be free from the influences of this world. I think folks talk about being worldly, you know, they think it's a rock watch, a lot of people do, and all like that, and, and, and anything that they can name. Worldliness is your desire to be prideful in what you are doing. To say that you've got the right to do something, maybe the Bible says that you don't have it. But this this image, his mark, in victory. Now, if you stay long enough, uh, like we was reading here the other night out of Ezekiel, about the ink horn, the, the servant that went through Jerusalem, and his his job was to put a mark upon every man that sighed or cried for the abominations of Jerusalem. And then the other five men were to go through and spare not the old and the young, we're just supposed to slaughter everything out. What that's telling us, there's coming a time that if you resist long enough, you cannot receive the mark of God, which is pressing towards the prize of the mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And, and to not press means that you draw back. To not press forward means that you've heard something in vain. And what happens to us, we resist the ways of God long enough, then we automatically become uh, stubborn, self-willed, serving God in, in matters that He don't want us to serve Him. And the whole time, and, and I heard this said by a great man of God. He said, you put a, a group of people together, a thousand people in this room, the coon hunters will find one another, uh, the deer hunters will find one another, the, the quilt makers will find one another, uh, you know, the, the, the morticians will find one another. The engineers will find one another. Leave people long enough, together long enough, and they'll come as a type of people. If you stay somewhere long enough, resisting what Christ is trying to bring you to be, you'll get to the ability where you can't grow. And I heard the same great man said this. He said, anything in nature, doesn't matter what it is, people can collide. If they don't grow, they die. Now, you know, plants can do that. The proper watering and all that grows, and they bring forth life, and you, with the proper care, we bring forth life, we bring forth fruit. But what we got to realize, you know, the Lord, He chastises. He wants to correct us for a while, but He says, you got to lift your hands up, the feet of knees, make some straight paths for your feet. And He went on, and when He concluded the chapter over, He said, we're not of them to draw back, you know, or uh, see that you refuse not him that speaketh from above, uh, because he's come to shape your world. That was what he's saying. I mean, he's going to deal with you, folks. And then there's nothing like being shook that once you've been saved, got good, God's blessed you, you felt the almighty power of God, and you know that your life's changed, and then all of a sudden he comes by and shakes you. <laughs> comes by and lets you know you're just not quite what you need to be. There's something in your life that, that He's going to deal with and, and He's going to change who you are. And But you've got to be willing to change. A lot of people, they use that. I know Obama won the White House preaching that. And I don't know what he's, he's changed things, but I think he's been back and still full uh, as far as what I can tell about it. But uh, the change has to be something that you're cultured to uh, receive. Because if you never change who you are, you cannot become more in the image of Christ. And that, that's his whole being in his image. Uh, doesn't mean that we're going to have the same haircut and all. You know, I don't know what so much he looks like. 
I would guess just like you can, I guess, in that form. But being in his image is an expression of his will and his purpose. Uh, being all that he wants you to be, caring for people like he wants you to care for them. One of the saddest things I've ever realized about myself is that I got caught up in a lot of religious doings of things and forgot to love people the whole time I was doing it. Forgot to do that and uh, left off the most weight, just the most important part about what Christ even wanted me to be. But I've refound myself. And I, I don't want to trouble you, folks. It all like that, but I know I've got the post that's not going to be living tonight. And some of you went as far to say, and probably will say, the church house has no place for that. That means because it has no place in you. Amen. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I, you know, if the postcard gets your name on, you best take it out and read it. <coughs> Deal with it, you know. That's all I can, uh, not all I can recommend to you about like that. Because if you stay somewhere long enough, remember the verse, the second one there, was we read out of the 15th chapter of Christ. <coughs> Whereby you are saved, if you keep in memory those things which I've told you, at least in time, you believe in vain. It's easy to hear things, believe in vain, go your own way and stay the person that you was when you come in, and Christ trying to change you. So let's get a hold of that again, and I, I'll help share before. Uh, I hope everybody's still with me here tonight. Well, it's been a very quiet service. I have this thought, Lord. I bless the singers trying to sing their little hearts out. I appreciate them so much. And I know they know the anointing. When it comes, just like I did, I had a little thought there. I don't know if we could have scared church mouse off tonight. You know. <laughs> uh, but maybe so, but maybe the preaching probably ain't scared one either. I'm not making light of you. Uh, me and the same boat. One of the silliest things I've ever heard in my life was somebody go home and they asked them what kind of service we have. They'd answer and say, well, it's very slow. <laughs> and they was the very one they clap their hands all night long. They just sit there, you know. Never offered a testimony, never sung a song, never read a scripture, but they sure know it's a slow service. <laughs> they never had nothing to contribute. Uh, so I wouldn't want to be that silly, you know. If that was me, I just, they wanted to know what kind of service they had and said, well, I didn't have a very good one. I didn't do a thing. I just sat there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave you with that note as they're saying it's come and get you a song together. I appreciate you being here. We'll keep you informed very, very early on the opening of the first service of the Feds that's forthcoming very soon, I would assume. that something happens, if that does, we'll just be right here if that does. Take place. So get around here and it's all a little while. Deal with the things that's in your life. Be performed in the image as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Oh,